Hello everybody, welcome to Timucua. We're going to start the show in about five minutes. You want to make sure you have everything you need from the bar because the bar will close in five minutes. And if you plan on performing, make sure that Nadia knows about it. So Nadia, where are you Nadia? There you go. Find Nadia, otherwise you cannot perform. Next.
signed up. Is there anyone who plans on being on stage even though they did not sign up? <laughs> <laughs> I have, oh, maybe I should do that first. <laughs> I like an entrance, but you know, <laughs> I probably should do this right. <laughs> Everybody saw the ads, yeah? Yes. <laughs> All righty. All right, let's do that again. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, my name is Benoit. This is my wife's living room. Uh, you're in our house right now. My wife's right over there, so that's why I'm saying that. When she's not here, sometimes I take liberties, but you know, this is very clear. I just live here. She owns the place. Um, the other thing is that uh, let me attract your attention to the artwork. Every month we have a different visual artist, and this month is Alex Moonsang. They are very talented, as you can see. Uh, this one's not for sale, this one's not for sale, but every other one is for sale. And this is like the last week that you can see her artwork. She painted live yesterday, the day before, and last week, or two weeks ago. Uh, and I hope that she will bring uh, this week or the piece that she produced. What in these? She took three shows to produce one piece, so I hope she brings it. <laughs> Um, so that we could see it. Uh, and, uh, but our prices are very good, so I hope that you buy some art uh, before you leave. And there's a price list out there, like $200, $400 for original work. Plus, the, the Alice book is fantastic in there. She's got like $10 zines in there, handmade. So you can check that out. Uh, now, uh, the other thing is we have three bathrooms, one on each floor. And please, please silence your cell phone and turn off your Bluetooth because the microphones sometimes are, they get interference from the Bluetooth from your phones, especially if you come up to perform. Who's slated to perform tonight? Raise your hand. All righty, fantastic. So it's a little bit different, like you know that you're supposed to stand on the X, right? If you've been here before, you can't really do that tonight because the beautiful thing that's there, I had to move things a little bit, so you have to be a little bit behind. But there's a music stand there, and if it stays there, it stays there. If you don't want it, you can stay, put it aside. But the point is, like, don't get close to that mic, or far from that mic, or walk out of the light, because then, you know, I can't, my cameras can't see you. So, and the people, the nice people at home, because we're streaming this live so on YouTube, so if uh, people are watching, then they can't see you, so that's, uh, and they can't hear you, so that kind of defeats the purpose of having this nice uh, open mic uh, situation. Uh, also, uh, what else do you... Oh yeah, if you're playing music, um, an instrument or whatever, it's all acoustic. This mic is not in the house, so that's fine. I will give you a better or a different ac acoustic uh, room in there for you if you're playing music. Don't worry about that. It's not going to be so dry as it is right now. This is the, the, the room as I designed it, but um, I have a system that can change the acoustics and I can choose uh, from 65 different rooms and I'll choose one of them. What? ACS is the name of the company, and it's a wonderful, wonderful, magical thing. Now, uh, what else? Oh yeah, uh, schedule-wise, like we're nearing the end of our of our season. We're taking July off, and then we're gonna see you back in uh, August for art and wellness. Is the first thing that's gonna happen on the second and the ninth. But um, our uh, uh, after that, basically every weekend after that is our international guitar festival. Uh, it includes like two Brazilian guitarists, uh, 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 Israeli guitar, uh, Yuval Amihai, incredible, incredible jazz guitarist. So check that out if you're interested in music. There's really, really wonderful shows happening in August. Now, this week after today, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon, is um, a streetcar named Desire. Uh, yes. Direct, directed by uh, Jeremy Sagers, uh, he's produced shows here before, they're always excellent, and um, the lead role is being played by Indigo Lee, who's a trans woman, and she lives right down the street, and uh, she's going to come and perform this, it's, I'm very excited about that, 
And uh, also, it's pretty cool that the official reporter for the, the Tennessee Williams estate is coming from Texas to see the, the and to write about the place. So it's a, it's a cool. I think you should get your tickets. It's more than half sold, uh, and which means usually that it will sell out. So be smart. Get your tickets as soon as possible. Um, I have talked enough. Anything? Oh, yeah, your tumbler. Uh, yeah, if you took some wine or water in a tumbler, those tumblers are wonderful. But please don't take it home after you're done for the night. Just put it on the bar. If you love it so much that you want one, we'll sell you a brand new one with a, a lid on and a Timucua logo on it and for 20 bucks. And it's worth it, I think, if you love it. Take one home, but brand, a brand new one. Don't take a used one home, just take a new one. Uh, anything else? Thank you to our volunteer. Oh, thank you to our volunteer tonight. Yeah! <laughs> Fantastic, Sabrina! Yes, yes. And I want to reiterate that the bar like, is basically now closed. So that's okay. You can survive for an hour without your wine and uh, you'll make it. Right? Anything else? So this is a series that's a monthly series every third Sunday of the month. And the, we have two wonderful ladies who uh, curate and take care of, organize everything. And one of them is here tonight. She's going to be your host for the night, and her name is Nadia Garçon, everybody! Thanks, everybody! Hi! Wow, yeah, I can't see through that because I'm so short. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Yeah. Awesome! Welcome to Authentic Selves. My name is Nadia Garçon. I'm the founder and executive director of Descolonizarte Teatro. That's my organization. I always like mention it. We are a professional Latinx theater organization working at the intersection of Latinx, immigrant, and LGBTQ plus identities. I'm also the workplay chair here at Timucua. And like Menua mentioned, I uh, host and organize Authentic Selves along with Lauren White, who's watching us from home. So everyone say, hello, Lauren. Hello, Lauren! Awesome. She like sent me a message. She's like, make sure you let them know. Okay. <laughs> they know now, Lauren. All right, so we have an awesome night tonight. Um, usually we have our feature poet at first, at the beginning, and then we have our open mic. But tonight we're going to do it a little differently uh, because we have a request. So we're going to start with the open mic, okay? So I'm going to start calling the people who actually signed up. There's a few who didn't, but it's looking good. The only way we're all going to make it on stage is if you all keep it to five minutes, each person. Okay, so how, how long do you have? Five minutes. Thank you. Cinco minutos. Muy bien. I heard that. <laughs> so five minutes. All right. Great. Uh, happy Pride, everyone. I wanted to say that too. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So we're going to start. I'm going to call three people at a time. That way you can start coming this way. Get ready. Be ready. All right. So we're going to start with De La Ghetto. All right. Christian and Harold. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children, dogs, and cats, they like I told. <laughs> she got my attention, physically and emotionally. When we first started talking, I was just joking with it. Not knowing that her conversation was chemistry, wasn't ready for commitment, but her love was still given. My flaws, she fixed with her hugs and her kiss. Her sex was the bomb. Woo wee! She was the shit. I love the way she throw that ass back. She knew I was a freak. <laughs> Okay, hold on. Okay. <laughs> I love the way she sucked that dick and throw that ass back. I used to cut the lights on just to watch her ass clap. I used to eat the pussy from the back like I was a porn star. Whoa. Baby girl, I know I was a born star. <laughs> I used to play with her pussy while she on the phone with her parents. I used to tease the right spot just to hear her moan a little bit. My dick stayed hard, like I was rolling on next to see her pussy soaking wet like New Orleans when the leverage breached. <laughs> I used to tell her that I love her when I'm in it, just to spice up our friendship. We was friends with benefits. De La Ghetto. <laughs> I realize what you're going through makes you not want to live life. 
The word love lies in you no more, hurting you deep inside. Tears constantly run down your cheek onto the pavement you leave behind a puddle. So pretty, very young, yet something small makes you weak. Got to losing your balance and falling off your feet. Missing the point that you have a strong and talented mind. Moving on with your life and leaving the past behind. Learn to love yourself and realizing that love is blind. With your life upside down and your feelings at an angle. No one's to trust when your heart is in danger. Possibility of loving means nothing to strangers when they pick you up and they throw you down like you. When they pick you up and they throw you down like you're some kind of dog. They tease with your emotions. They play games with your heart. You lose self-control and now you're falling apart. Day in, day out with the same thing on your chest. It makes you sick to your stomach and have you shorten the breath. De La Ghetto. Five, five, brown eyes, she was amazing. Ass on swole, good gracious. I quickly realized it wasn't about her body, it was about her mind. I tried to get in the pants, she said it takes time. And said, it's cool, you nasty. See you trying to move in love fast. You about to crash and burn, this is a lesson you about to learn for thinking I have a friendly ass vagina. Kinda wonder what makes you think that. Remember all easy cat ain't good cat. I'm like, facts. She said, we ain't even have a decent conversation, but you want to come over to penetrate me. I'm not that type of chick, right? Currently, you're thinking with your dick, right? All mans are dogs. You proved it. In my number, you should just lose it. Yeah, you were splitting game in my ear like you was Cupid. What you thought I was? Stupid? I'm a bitch with standards. If I knew this what you was calling for, I wouldn't even answer. De La Ghetto. <laughs> Pretty short, but first one's called Obstacle Three. Jade is the ugliest color, the cloying, coziest lover, salacious, sinuous siren slinking out of my dreams and beneath the covers. She sings in periodic, semiotic transmutations, verses like off air jagged transmission signals of erd static television dismal that make the lighter wick flicker than spark, spark, spark. It's all angular from here, serrated enthusiasm, sedated emoting and motive, nervous playmaking every belief into grim line preliminaries stuck in circular inquiries like what to do with in between spaces, what to do with threaded seam faces, but sit and pull and so, again, my notion craves oblivion erasure, though devotions kept me from the ocean. Baby, give it to me once on the rocks for a minute, just to lubricate the tongue and slip the mind. Now see, I am another man, the moxie bravado kind, all captions, no action. Always on the lookout for a fix of gratified and satisfied. Swimming in the basest pleasures, sinking for the feeblest treasures, self-induced diver complex. Love drunk in rogue stained lips, vogue mode wink and flip of the hips, and I'm not with her anymore, I've got undercut eyes for only you. So when the show is over, will you come home with me? But soft cope never works, and misdirection always frowns, until claustrophobia suffocates and intoxication drowns. And then, self-shattered reality, stealing hearts and stealing time, dealing hurts and feeling mime, forgetful and comatose inclined, please forgive me that I'm Oh, but here it comes again, indulgent impulse itch to shake the etch-a-sketch. Days of sand trap pudding, and is this it? <laughs> all right, all right. So one more. That one's too serious. So, and old. So I wrote something new. It's called... Um, Kill switch inhibition, urge overdrive. Um, not sure if this was a good idea yet. <laughs> Attention to all the girly serving groovy goodness, the real mamacitas who just leave me breathless. Excuse the manner of my expression, but I just have one question. You looking? 
Male here, rocket in his pocket with an ass and hips and lips that just don't quit. I've seen the way you strut and how you flaunt it, and I hate to say it, but I've been thinking that the only way you could look better is if we got together. <laughs> Proposition. I could be your boy toy lover, all flagrant batting eyelash action and oddball charmer attraction until there's nothing left for us to do but unwrap one another and pop the bottle with a screw. Work your body back to front and trail its humming vibrations to stunt dive deliver into snatched up relations. Or even deeper still, what comes next? Me two times and again and again and again and again. Satisfaction ultra guaranteed until we turn up in the afterworld, amen. <laughs> and to be totally clear, this lust is so sincere. But if you want to roll with me, you've got to know how to quickly flip from quirky good girl to the baddest you can be. So what do you say? Don't you just want to? <laughs> Hit me up. No delay. First and foremost, I'd like to pay my respects to the creator without whom nothing is possible. I'd like to welcome you all with the warmest of greetings, and that is the greetings of peace and love. So the poem that I want to share with you tonight is inspired by a book and uh, two movies. It's called All Quiet on the Western Front. Yeah. And basically it's about a group of German youth prior to World War I who had been convinced by society they live in that to go to war was something that was glamorous and exciting. So they, they signed up and they quickly learned that the realities of war is a lot different than how they portray it to be. It was death and it was all about survival. So this is uh, my poetic rendition of All Quiet on, on the Western Front. All the soldiers who came marching home from war were loveless in the eyes. They couldn't love no fucking more. They had seen the other side, a side they wasn't supposed to see. So they had to die just to set their soul free. They had crossed over and had seen life and death. So with confusion in their eyes, they took their last breath. Now there's nothing left. When they looked in the mirror and wondered what they'd see, there was no reflection. It was black like me. Black like my woes. Black like some pearls. Black like the death rose. The lost souls. I'm tired of fighting a war that I can't win. They want me to cross the lake of fire, which is a lake that I can't swim. Drown in the depths of despair. Bodies everywhere. War's not fair. Stepping over corpses of my fallen comrades. No time for digging graves or feeling sad. Cause in war it's survival of the fittest. And to kill without compassion or remorse makes us the best of the fittest. But how do I survive with these images in my mind when this war is ended? How can I hug my little girl knowing that I've taken the life of someone's little girl? So now I'm at war with self. Why does mankind kill mankind for material possessions when mankind is mankind's greatest wealth? What were the lessons that were learned when a nation's flags were hung for signs of achievement and power, but when the nations fell, their flags were burned. The ideologies and systems of government were overturned. Now they want me to fight and die for someone else's idea. So they can write letters home to my mother about how I died a valiant death. But empty words bring no solace, no promise, no closure, no peace of mind to the unknown soldier whose bones still litter the battlefields, opposite of the field of dreams. His blood runs in the river streams because they've been taught that it's honorable to die in service of the kings. All quiet on the Western Front. All right. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, this is a space where we want to be our authentic self. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for coming back. There are some people here who have been here several times, like Harold. All right, so I'm going to call our next three. So just do me a favor when I call you. Just go ahead and stand up so you're ready there. Uh, we have Doug, Kaya, and Olivia. <laughs>
course. Can you guys see me? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so, I mean, I was going to give a disclaimer originally, but I feel like after our first two performers, we don't have to. Um, but I'm kind of sad that I'm going third because you guys were so good. But this was inspired by my, um, my experiences with mental health issues. So I hope to whoever's out there that feels like they're alone that you can relate to this. The darkness threatens to swallow me whole. The darkness threatens to take me in. The darkness is my only comfort. The darkness is my only friend. The darkness, oh, it never leaves me. It is more loyal than people have been. It listens when I'm needy. It wallows in my sin. Oh, darkness, yes, I carry it with me. It has become a stain on my soul. How I would love to put it down, but there's nowhere else for it to go. The darkness, it is a parasite. It cannot live without a host. I would never wish this plight on another, but I do wish that it would go. The darkness is a poison traveling through every vein. It is filling my heart, it is filling my mind. Will I ever be the same? It seems the darkness is taking over and I do not seem to mind. Someone please rescue me, I am running out of time. There is only one way out, he says, and I know you know the way. This could end anytime you want, but until then, I will always play. Okay, that's it for me. <laughs> Olivia, and I'm gonna tune this thing really quick. So I work in this project called the Lullaby Project, which essentially um, is uh, musicians work with new parents to process their emotions of childbirth and. Um, write lullabies for their children and in practice for that uh, we I um, write lullabies processing my own emotions so this is just a little one of those you dream of a day where everything's in place where you can just be troubles all erase. You look at others' lives and think they have it all, but you don't see their battles or the moments they may fall. Their grass is always greener, their sky is always bluer, their silver linings bright.
Hello. Hello. I am Doug, the diva Curtis was referring to. I just didn't expect to be called up so fast when I signed up last. Um, okay. I'll do this. I'll move off to the side. How about that? Someone's going to be blocked no matter what. I write stories from the road. I travel for a living, and um, I find everything funny. And lots of funny things happen on the road. So this is uh, one of those stories. I almost always walk into my hotel of the night as a road-weary traveler, one eye open, ready to pass out for the evening or at least an hour or two if an event is restlessly waiting. So perhaps this mind-numbing state makes conversations like the one I'm about to share with you seem even more bizarre to me than they really are. You be the judge. It was in a small Midwestern town that I entered a hotel, approached the front desk, gave my name, handed over my license and credit card, and told the man I had a reservation for one night. It's worth briefly veering from the main point here to share the psychological phenomenon of people treating you better when they think you're important. In this case, when you've spent so much money at a particular hotel chain that you've earned their gratitude. Of course, the gratitude really comes from the top of the food chain, but the minions are trained to smile, and they usually do if super amazing double diamond top tier VIP shows up on their screen. They might give you a look that says, why are you interrupting my day when you first show up? But once they see the computer version of how great you are, they smile. Many times it's an internal smile, but at least they say thank you for being a super amazing blah, blah, blah. Well, this particular desk clerk finished his rote welcome while internally smiling looked up at me and said, do you have a cat? Do I have a cat? I thought to myself. Now, I've been a traveling artist and musician for about 20 years, and this seemed like an odd way to open up the conversation. I paused long enough to try to come up with anything else to say, but dumbstruck as I was, I couldn't. So I looked at him quizzically and repeated the question back to him. Do I have a cat? Yes, do you have a cat? Well, now, mind you, I'm pretty good at playful banter and even verbal sparring, but this one really caught me off guard. I just didn't have any grasp on how to respond. You mean cat meow meow cat? <laughs> Was all I could come up with while involuntarily scrunching up my face, exemplifying obvious confusion. Yes, a cat. Do you have a cat? He responded with a curt tone that demonstrated his increased frustration. Now... An interesting caveat of this matter is that at the time, in fact, I did have a cat. <laughs> His name was Silo. Apparently, he was found as a kitten on a construction site hiding behind an asphalt silo, and he was one of the loves of my life. But this desk clerk couldn't possibly know that, could he? Was I on candid camera? Was I being punked? The level of this clerk's wittedness just didn't seem lofty enough to pull off a good practical joke, so I decided I needed to play this one at face value. So I took a deep breath and responded, Well, I do, but he's at home. <laughs> so you don't have a cat. At this point, I could no longer hide my amusement stemming from this exchange. And as the wry smile appeared on my face, I replied, no, not with me. Is that going to be a problem? <laughs> At this point, my mojo was returning now, and I was really getting into this. If I have absolutely no idea what's going on, I sure as hell am going to at least enjoy myself. So many questions flooded my mind. Do I need a cat to check in? <laughs> Where the hell am I going to get a cat this time of night? I'm sure PetSmart is closed by now. And who knows if they even have any that are available. I could look for a stray, but that doesn't seem too terribly safe. I don't even know anybody in the area, so I can't phone a friend to borrow a cat. The clerk, not surprisingly, did not share my amusement, but finally realized I was due for an explanation, and he told me that whichever hotel agent made the reservation for me had noted that I would be bringing a cat, and that there was an extra charge for that. I thought to myself, this might have been good information to start the conversation with. Although in hindsight, I'm glad he didn't, because it had me shaking my head for hours. 
and rehashing the conversation in my mind was a wonderful way to laugh myself to sleep. Good night, Silo. <laughs> I just want to remind you that it's an open mic so you can do stories, you know, you can do music, um, essays, just kidding. <laughs> or maybe those, yes. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to continue calling the people who actually signed up online. That's why the order is a little weird. So if you sign up online, I'm calling you first just in case because of the time. And then I'm moving on. So we're going to go with uh, Stella, Anthony, and Ian. here nowhere near here I live like two hours away actually um, I drove all this way to support Curtis who's amazing um, and thank you for this event thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my art um, I've been a spoken word artist for some time um, and I do this to connect so if this connects to you right please let me know I'd love to talk with you some more afterwards, all right? Okay, um, this is called Black Art. This is the first time I'm doing this poem, <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah, super new. Um, first time I'm doing this poem. Do you mind moving this way so I can hear you and the recording? Oh, okay, oh, yeah. Yes. Sorry, my bad, okay. Um, all right, Black Art. I have seen black bodies turn into rap songs, spitting over breaking news, a melody we're so used to that we confuse it with music. White hatred is the muse, so we use it. Turn eulogies into lyrics so we don't forget their last words. I have seen writers call out names on stages like a seance, their pen and paper a Ouija board, seeing if the souls of the departed will talk back to them, will all clap for them. Now imagine that being your son's name, your brother's name, your father's name, reliving their death while white folks relive their last breath for pleasure. We die for their amusement. We pop, lock, and drop it while they cock, pop, and drop kids. I've seen dancers stand in second position with their hands up, ready to break their bodies in honor of black trauma, break beats to life support machines, the finale of Flatline, then take a bow to the sound of clapping, to the sound of click clapping. Watch them Harlem shake their way into our next poem. I've seen painters dip their brush into the blood on the streets to make their masterpiece. Rattle cans of pent up rage to paint walls, trains, buses, any surface that can carry the weight of black faces that once were but will never be anymore. Question, why aren't there more murals for the living? Answer, because black lives only matter when they're dead. I've seen black characters not make it past the previews, show up in the trailer, but not live long enough to have lines in the movie, written out before they could develop. Then we stare at the end credits, praying for a playback. Our bars have kept us locked in, stuck in the same two-step for generations, unable to breathe. We've been painting with the same color scheme. We are a traumatized people. See how we erase one name for 
another, how we replace their hate with bright colors, but even in our wildest imagination, we are still dying. And how can you bother to write a life into existence when it was doomed to be art? She took us to church. Oh my goodness. Man, preach, 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 preach. All right. I don't know how I'm going to follow that up. <laughs> I'm going to do me. I'm going to do me. But that was excellent. That was powerful. That hit right here. So my name is Anthony Collins. I have a stage name that I don't use too often, but it's uh, TC the Grio. Um, you might see it pop up every now and again um, if you hear me perform. He might not, so. <laughs> I got two, form, two poems for you tonight. Um, they're both going to be centered around Father's Day. I'm a father. Um, I have one poem about me interacting with my father, and I have a poem for my, me interacting with my son. Uh, I have a daughter also, but I didn't have time to write one for her, and my son's the <laughs> oldest. So, you know, I got, I'll make it right. I'll make it right. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> this poem is called Silver Nickels. I shake two silver nickels in my palm. I lay the pair on the butcher block counter to pay for two grenade juices at the blue corner store. Pops and I stroll the unpaved path along Carver Drive. Flattened by shoes hard as the grit that remains. Pops chucks deuces to L, washing a Corolla at his car wash. He lifts his chin, chucks deuces back. L's golden grin gleams. He's been Pops pal since sophomores at Killian High. The store. A finch flies through doors, sliding open and groaning, like Kate mumbling and mopping linoleum floors. Marlboro trucky cap pulled low as Barry's baritone. White cap butchers bob and groove wrapped in sunlight beaming through windows while wrapping paper over chicken quarters and full racks of ribs. Later this afternoon, meat will sizzle and smoke on Buick-sized barbecue smokers, aroma billowing up. Distant thunder is God's belly grumbling. Fluorescence flicker, a dim exit sign hangs over a dark and narrow corridor at the end, light glows between black burglar bars. Like fractured ceramic tile, black bars contour white light into a monarch butterfly. Stacked blue milk crates cradle kaleidoscopes, grenade juice flavors. I grab two orange, one for now, one for later, now and later. Tie-dyed candy packages stripe the beige racks above. They'll quench thirst for the rainbow I saw on the way. I rub two nickels, nickels too few by two. I rub two nickels, two nickels too few by two. Pops presses four nickels to my palm and says, grab a blue one too. All right, that's the first one. And this is the one about my son. He, uh, at the time I, I guess this, this incident, this interaction happened, he was uh, still in the belly. So um, that was a, a wonderful time. So across worlds. I talked to my wife's belly more than I talked to her. <laughs> She's pregnant. Craves foot and back rubs over anything not satisfying a craving. She's nine months, needs nine extra pillows to comfort her body. I call these. Cloud nine, <laughs> bad dad joke. <laughs> My son and I don't talk much either. We play hide and seek as mommy lies across a body of pillows. The game goes like this. I say, one, two, three, come find me. 
Hide on the quiet side of the belly. Wait till tiny fingers trace earlobes in utero sign language for me to do it again and again and again. And I do. It's getting late. I play Pandora on my iPhone. Pillow top jukebox massaging the mood. Smooth as hot 105. Freddy Cruz DJs a quiet storm. I lower the volume. White ball on my phone screen shrinks left. Music making room for my breathing. My breathing is a song sang over light thumps. Bump, bump. Bass drum thumping in my chest. Song for my son that'll float across airwaves after my drumbeat ends. I press my ear to the belly. Listen to the world the womb cradles. Like earth in the universe's womb, drifting. My son drifts, cuddles my cheek and stays there. He's sleeping. The AC rumbles like mountains, shaking, grinding. I'm stubborn as mountains sometimes, but my son parts peaks like fog, revealing, revealing a dawn rising between Himalayan mountains. Haven't even seen him yet, and he's so amazing. His room is a page from Jungle Book, the first page to a story. Stuffed monkey in his crib is his soon-to-be soon first friend. He'll lie there watching dreams like holograms projecting from the sparkles in his eyes. Holograms that'll glow like northern lights. Emerald, emerald light waves tiding across the sky. Northern lights like him are portals between this world and places of the most high. I mean, if uh, this is from a, a series of fables that I'm doing uh, about the tarot, uh, this is the Four of Wands. We're all familiar with the great names of art, are we not? Da Vinci, Picasso, Ross, yes? <laughs> but how many of you have heard of Henry Merlin Turtledove? Yes. Well... <laughs> That is unsurprising because Henry Merlin Turtle Dove was, to be frank, a turtle dove. He hatched from the middle branch of a European silver fir in the city of Heidelberg, Germany. And he enjoyed all the normal things of his turtle dove youth. <laughs> Singing with his siblings, eating what his mother threw up. And, of course, taking the annual family vacation to sub-Saharan Africa. And it was on one of these trips that he noticed that he had become a fine turtle dove. Smooth, round head, sharp, pointy beak, dark gray circle around his neck. And so, on the flight home, decided he could no longer return to the family nest that he had lived in his life until then and would have to start his own. So Henry Merlin Turtle Dove flew several miles away from his home tree and came to another European silver fir, empty but with strong branches, and decided this would be the place. He started searching for twigs, paying close attention to how they would fit together, balance off each other, make tension against each other in order to create the necessary build of the nest. And once he had it, Round and he had laid shredded pine bark in the center for softness. It was just cozy enough for him and one other and a couple eggs. Henry Merlin was proud of his work, but he wanted something to set it apart. So he went down to the ground and started looking just for one last little ornament. And when he did, he looked up and through his nest, sitting on the branch, he could see light filtering through the holes in the twigs. And Henry Merlin stood in awe of it. And then, without thinking about it, almost as instinctively as he created the nest, he gathered more twigs and arranged them into the shape of a frame. Then he found other darker twigs to represent the underside of the nest, and one thick black one representing 
the branch that it sat across, and then he found tiny white stones and filled them into the gaps of his twigs. He stood back and looked at his portrait and was almost more proud of this than he was of the nest to begin with. Now it was at that moment that another turtle dove was flying by and saw this work. And overnight, Henry Merlin Turtle Dove became the talk of the bird art world. He, in fact, started the bird art world. But once it started, it was in full swing. They immediately had pretentious cafes and worthless <laughs> bird art history degrees and, and agents. And at the center of it all was Henry Merlin and his twiggings. You know, like paintings, but made out of twigs. He started what he called the Baroque art movement, named, of course, for the number of sticks that had to be Baroque in for it to work. <laughs> and he was very popular. He was always surrounded by plenty of chicks. Women, I'm sorry, I'm using a very outdated term. Women with him there in the nest. But he started to feel like, hey... I think a, uh, eggs would really cramp this style. So eventually he felt cramped in the nest himself, decided to sell it. He didn't get much, it was a nest. And bought a loft in Midtown and a gallery in Chelsea. But after his third shows, his third show of the underside of nests, Henry Merlin's uh, agent came to him and said, people were saying he was getting stale. People were saying what he was doing was growing old and he needed to, to branch out. <laughs> Henry Merlin didn't like this idea. He didn't know how to come up with something new. He had just been struck by it. And he thought maybe what he needed to do was get people closer to the experience that he had had. So he, in his next series, he looked for shinier stones. He found iron filings and ball bearings and aquarium gravel and filled it in with that. And immediately, Henry Merlin Turtle Dove was labeled kitsch. He was schlock. He was thrown out of the fine art world, which again had only flapped into existence like two months ago. They were all now concerned with Jackson Pelican, who was throwing fish guts at the dock. <laughs> but there were still plenty of buyers plenty of chicks, only now they were moms and they wore sweaters and they, they wanted him to autograph them, which was very difficult to do in twigs. He had become the Thomas Kincaid of the bird art world, a kind of fine art kitsch that had no real soul or meaning, but plenty of commercial appeal. <laughs> Well, the money kept coming in, but Henry Merlin didn't know what to do with it, so he decided to take a vacation back to his homeland, and he found the very first nest that he ever built, and in it he saw the family of the guy that he had sold the nest to. They were just getting ready to start on their first vacation, and he saw their two kids chirping to each other, and then one chirped in one note, and another in another note, and it was a combination he had never actually heard before. Henry Merlin tried to replicate it, and he liked the sound so much that for the first time since his youth, Henry Merlin Turtle Dove began to sing. Early success can be a comfortable home, but comfort and inspiration are not friends. That's going to be Irva, uh, Disco, and Clover. And while they get here, I just want to go ahead and start walking over. And while you get there, I just want to mention that I'm trying to remember to take pictures. Lauren is really good about it, but she's not here. And I may have missed a few people, so I'm so sorry. But if you took pictures, please, please let me know. And then I can tell you where to send them. Or you can tag Timoqua or myself, and then we can get them that way. Okay, you ready? Thank you. <laughs> All right.
Um, hello. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know if you can hear my guitar or not, but I hope you can. So, um, yeah, I'm Irva. I'll be singing Dandelions by Ruth V. I don't know if you've heard of that song or not, but I hope so. Uh, but thank you. Uh, all right, well, see, if I, I learned this today, so if I mess up, you didn't, you didn't see me mess up, okay? Shh, you never saw it. You never saw it, all right? All right, ready? Dandelions 
everybody hear me? Yeah. Cool. I've never done this before. Um, so I doubt that I'll be as good as all our wonderful, wonderful performers that have gone so far. Yes. Uh -huh. But I'm going to be singing uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow from Wizard of Oz. Favorite, favorite childhood movie. God help me. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. Dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me, where troubles melt like lemon drops away above the chimney tops. That's where you'll find me Somewhere over the rainbow Bloom birds fly Birds fly over the rainbow Why then oh why can't I? If happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? Flavor. High noon. Good evening. Hi. Hi. No, that's the name of the poem. <laughs> High noon. <laughs> this day I dared, dared to leap from skyborn plain and name of father, son, and ghost my unquenchable refrain. Twelve o'clock the hour, the hour I vanquished dread of doom. I had on the chutes and helmet and was harnessed by high noon. Quite a jolty takeoff from the runway field of grass. Our craft so small, the windows hissed as air through gaps did pass. My back against the panel, where the gauges all were strewn. My pilot smiled the deepest smile and said, three thousand soon. Suddenly the latch of the plane door now was thrown. The gushing gale of wind outside quelled the engine's drone. But not so quelled my senses, now as earthward gaped my eyes. For broccoli trees and coffee drop lakes made eager courage rise. Go, cried my instructor, into oxygen I sprang. Cascading supersonic, fears were stifled by the tang. My parachute puffed open. That umbrella overhead saw me floating like a bubble by the drop zone arrow led. This sky to earth glissando, a great triangle high, high noon, high up, high feeling, I don't need wings to fly. Thank you. Atoll. Hormonally, that is, this heart flock loves lagoon instead of breakers. Testosterone unfurls to firstling colors. 
some genius sweep of spectrum. Subsurface, sun finds perfect footage. Psyche spreads its reef, sheaf of thriving acres. Corals clasp about me. Rainbow swarms profound me in right waters. Passion placid, white cap shirk, waves they're populating. Peripheral murk of stirring shacked at surface. Whilst maritime suspicion reeks from land, would be continent, hell bent to hoist, regale as foist, floral hug from friend, volcano sunken. Why don't you? Why don't you? Why don't you look me in the eye? Oh, nomad roaming passerby? Does it take as much an effort to receive my lucid glance as does to give it? What does sparkling tell my would-be walkway love? Do I guess in equal awkwardness where I find no equal eye? Is it a slatted, blinded innocence poking through the pain that streams my ready windows? It's the naked eye we really crave, of course, deepest, deepest down. Clear, clean, undaunted contact, our only sought for kiss, if our eyes can only touch. And oh, how much we miss, my friend, my love, now passing by. Permitting paranoia planks to slip into our eye with misconducted messages. Right. I'm looking at the time. Okay. Maybe I should have waited. <laughs> I'm looking at the time, and we have exactly the time for three more people so that we can have our feature, and that's going to be Walter, Owen, and Londi. And that's our last three. I wrote this... Um after. Excuse me, uh, do you need the music stand? Um, no. I'll just take it away because like, it's just in the, in the shot. So. Okay. You can put it by in the music. It's right there. Thank you. I wrote this after um, a suicide attempt and waking up in the hospital um, the next day after dying on the operating table and um, being rolled off into the mental institution on the fourth floor against my own will and put into a straight jacket. After my wife um, divorce, we served me divorce papers the one month prior to us losing our second child in miscarriage, and my sister died on the same day. I got served divorce papers. My 27-year-old sister died of, can of cancer, so I wrote this. Babies are still arriving. That's a good sign. Let's have a good time. Start pouring the wine. Let the sun shine. Every morning you rise, you begin a new day. At the first wake of tomorrow, do not start an old life inside of a new day. Forgive old things away. Allow all things to pass away and to become something new. Sing something new. Learn something new. Learn of you. Who? Most of all, remember to only return to your past to pick all the flowers you missed. Why? Why? Because your future is waiting on you to create it or not. Your future is created only by design, and the design by which you give it is what it will be. It's been proven in science that every person has a reservoir of genius within them that we rarely access or attain to our entire lives. 
It's been said that every person comes up with six ideas on a daily basis that have the potential to accumulate wealth adequately to allow you the opportunity to never work another day in your life. But out of the six ideas, two of them are billion dollar ideas. The only reason we don't get our ideas is because we don't sit down and start taking action rapidly today. S-T-A-R-T. Start taking action rapidly today. Manifesting our ideas into existence. How? Through a copyright, tangibly manifesting, a copyright, a website, a domain name, a YouTube video, Instagram video, a TikTok video that could possibly go viral, or getting on a stage like this. Remember this, most of all, 98% of all men and women will never attain to the greatness within them because someone tells them they can't, because they project their negative self-confidence on you because they don't believe they can do it. I'll give you, there's a magnitude of reasons, a multitude of reasons why, but I'll give you the five primary reasons for sake of time. Number one, fear of failure. Number two, fear of success. What if I get my dreams? I get my goals. I get the house, the car, the spouse, all the money and the wealth. And what if it destroys me in the process we tell ourselves? Number three, fear of finding out who we are at the end of the day. Number four, fear of of other, of, like I said earlier, fear of other people's negative self projections onto us, but get this one, you guys. It took me a long time to get to some fear of our own negative self projection onto other people. But the fifth and most profound, most prolific, most prominent reason why 98% of all men and women will never attain to the greatness within them and go to their grave asking God why, oh, why is because at the end of the day, we tell ourselves, no, I can't more than anything else. So from this day, I want you to start telling yourself, yes, I can, yes, I will, yes, I must attain to the greatness within me at all costs, no matter what. Even if my own father and mother who are pastors were to turn their back on me for smoking weed and drinking alcohol, you must remember that there is something within every single one of us that no one else can do. Not just one thing, but many things, and not just many things, but an infinite amount of things. There's nothing being done today that does not need to be done better or perfected for tomorrow. So ask yourself, self, what am I waiting for? Hi. Um, This Father's Day, I'm not with my father. He's in uh, Fort Lauderdale. I'm from Broward County. And this is his first Father's Day without his father. Um, In August, my grandfather died of uh, cancer of the arteries. Um, So I have a series of two poems, one about my reaction to that and one about my reflection on death afterwards. So the first one is called Learning How to Be a Broward Driver. The millionaires always tell you to be a lifelong learner. I've always been learning, even though I ain't lived a long life. It might not be that long that's left to be determined, but I might just make it to 90 out of spite. If I make it to 90, I better be well learned or I'm gonna learn how to fucking fight. I find it interesting to remember the things I gotta relearn. It's funny how it feels like life comes back to you no matter where you fucking turn to because I come from a place where all those crazy I-4 truckers yearn to. It's a place I never try to return to, but when I do, I got to relearn how to be a Broward driver. (laughs) Sometimes it feels like your heart's got too much weight. I don't even want to hear the truth until it's too late. I was chilling with no goal in mind. When life threw on a filter like it was a battle cry, well, I thought it was no cry of mine. It was a cry for help. I didn't know it, but I barely felt what you had put out to me. I didn't know it, but I barely felt what you had put out to me. I felt two tragedies at the same time, two tiny wars in the same mind. I felt terrible because one felt weightier, even though they were the same kind, two tragedies at the same time. One cared for me, one supported me. It feels like these issues should feel the same to me. The only thing that's the same is the lack of peace. I never expected two tragedies. I never expected what I'd be learning when one of the people who taught you how to learn withers in front of you. It's a goddamn tragedy. But I distract myself by learning how to be a Broward driver. 
You skirt and slide on each bend, and then those fun little facts that you remember hit you up again and again and again. My friends ask me how I'm doing. I ball those morbid Snapple caps and drop them on them again and again. I learned that in hospice, sometimes the clocks don't work, but it's inappropriate to rely on your phone for the time. And I learned that there's no paper straws in hospice. I learned the first floor of the hospital closes at 12, and the second floor is confusing. I learned that hospice is quiet, not as a rule, but a tendency. And that it makes the other's family laughter all the more pungent and their wails all the more piercing. I learned that hospice makes you want to hug a stranger. And I learned that when your grandpa is dying, you get unlimited off-brand soda. I learned the unimaginable weight of last words and twisted myself when I realized I never heard them before. But with tears in your eyes, you decide to finally go back home, so you hop on I-595. Your car is roaring so loud you want it to replace life's battle cry. But every time you close your eyes, the boom of that motor gets replaced with the whispers of your family's sighs, the singe of burnt-out aspirations. You hope it cauterizes your family relations. You scream to the point of asphyxiation. You scream to the point that to call it a scream shows your desperation, and you realize that you're driving in Broward again. No wonder you can't find your orientation. You want to go home, but it's too goddamn far. If you drive so much more, you're going to get, have to get service on your car. You're seeing the sign for sunrise, but all you can think about are sunsets. The sun rises, you just drove the whole night, you just race with light on I-95, but you're not a dri Broward driver anymore. Thank you. Um, this second one's a, a little bit shorter. It's called palate. Do you understand how unique your palate is? Your association with colors is to an extent tethered to biology, but life has a way of coloring one's psychology. What each color means to me isn't the same as what it's thought to be. If you want to know, just talk to me. I think a quiet, helpless peace is a particular shade of blue. And I know what you're thinking, what shade of blue? If I had to pick a hue, it would be a nice and bright sky blue. It's always been there, at the very least in your memories. It's just so constant because it's what you've been trained to see. But I purposely don't find comfort in absolute consistency. The brightness isn't convincing, it strains my eyes. I think suffering is a distinct shade of blue. I know what you're thinking, what shade of blue? If I had to pick a hue, it would be a powder baby blue. It's a shade that creeps darker, it's a shade that you can deny when it starts up. It's how you notice your life slowly turning into a nighttime movie filter. I think death is a particular shade of blue. And I know what you're thinking. What shade of blue? If I had to pick a hue, it would be a dark navy blue. Easily spotted, indefinite, like punctuation, Questions of where you might take residence. It's hard to be confident in destination, but when I'm dead and I'm slowly tugged from the hug of my deathbed, I picture myself rising into the atmosphere overhead. Slowly, but surely, my vision will fade from a bright sky blue to a light baby blue and darken to a distinct navy blue. Thank you. I hope everybody's well. Just, just do this poetry and get out the way. <laughs> back up, back up. Thank you. Oh, yes. On the X. <laughs> the other day I quit poetry. I shut my notebook, threw my pen. My notebook opened itself back up and my pen flew back into my grip again like Thor's hammer returning to him. 
I never thought I'd be this many years in. I only started writing to impress a girl thinking that that would have been the end. I did not know that a fire could start from a spark. I did not know that for years to come, I'll be transforming words into Noah's Ark, saving others from the storms in their lives, encouraging them to reach the mark. I did not know that I'll be this many years in. <laughs> So the other day, out of exhaustion, I ripped up my notebook, threw out my pen, my notebook put itself back together, and my pen flew back into my grip again like Thor's hammer returning to him. I cried on the inside. My plan was just to write one poem, but then I found out I had many more inside. That one poem turned into two. Two poems turned into a poetry notebook. My homeboy said, Lundy, have you ever heard of a poetry venue. I told them uh, I'm just going to perform this one time. Uh, that one time uh, turned into way more than a few. Uh, that one time uh, turned into many more nights and many more venues, many more metaphors, many more similes, many more revisions, many more stories, many more edits, many more analogies. So out of exhaustion, I quit. I threw out my poetry notebook and my pen. That's crazy. <laughs> Only for them to reappear on my desk again. Woo. I tried to let go. But my brother. Poetry reminded me that it was not something that could just be discarded. It is tied oh, to my soul, living in my heart, flowing in my veins, voltage in my bones. It claimed my body as its own. Years ago, it was just a stray dog that followed me home. I figured I would give it food and water for a few days and tell it to move on. Years later, this dog, a little older, still lives in my home, leaving fur on the couch, chewing on my shoes, barking at nothing, keeping me awake, leaving torment in its wake, haunting me, lurking in my bedroom at night, flickering the bedroom lights, rustling the window blinds, knocking on the bedroom walls, knocking on the walls of my skull, taking control over my thoughts, taking control over my body, taking control over my life years ago. <sighs> In my freshman year of high school, I wrote my first poem. At the time, my brother, I was just trying to impress a girl. <laughs> In the process, I followed poetry home. She gave me food and water for a few days, and ever yeah. since then, I didn't move on. 20 years later, this dog is no longer stray. Poetry took me in as her own. Until this day, I live in her home. making this such an awesome space. This, we want it to be authentic selves, and we're just so excited to have all of you here. And we're very excited to have our feature poet for tonight, because this is somebody who has been here from the beginning, coming every month to perform in the open mic. And um, 
Usually we have a bio that I read. I brought the paper and everything, but I don't have anything. <laughs> because Curtis was like, no, don't do a bio. I'm glad you don't have a bio. Uh, so I will tell you the things I know. Like I said, Curtis has been here every month. Uh, some incredible poems every month have been shared here by him. And um, uh, Lauren calls him once in a while, Carlos, for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> that should be mentioned. Uh, yeah, and so we're very excited to have Curtis, who also... Um, I think it's a great ally of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, I have to mention that because it's pride. And well, tomorrow is Juneteenth. So I hope we also like remember all of the things that these, these two celebrations mean because they are very important. So I want to introduce Curtis Xylophone Mayers. <laughs> I told her to say xylophone, even though it's not my real middle name, but she still mispronounced Meyer, which is perfect. Which is perfect. Please give a round of applause for Timakua Arts. <laughs> happy Father's Day, happy Juneteenth, happy Pride. Um, everything you put in this tonight will be going to the Zebra Coalition. It is an organization on Mills Avenue. Uh, that helps uh, LG, homeless, dis, uh, unhoused, I don't know what the PC term is, uh, uh, LGBTQIA plus teens. Uh, I have a personal alliance to them because they gave two of my friends a home. And if you don't care about que queer teens having a home, think of it as punching DeSantis in the face. So I'm gonna pass that. <laughs> Anything you put in that will go to wrap the doors to them. Um, Tomorrow to the day, I don't believe in coincidences, is my 20th anniversary of performing spoken word on stage. So thank you for that, Lundy. And I was debating whether to do this, but then Stella said the word seance. There's a few friends of mine who I've known in the building from that very first night but uh, I'd like to summon some friends real quick. David Strat Campbell, David Allen Blair, Kelly Fitzpatrick, Tavis Brunson, Tim Rumsey, Aaron Jacob, Leslie Halpern, Yolanda Ramirez, John Rodriguez, Chris Burkoff, Bob Calabrese, Shoppy Schultz. Bernard Schobert, better known as the clute to his friends. Shannon Lee, Jack McCarthy, my cousin Jeff who filmed me in Canada. My grandpa Brian, my aunt Katie, my grand Sylvia who we sung uh, somewhere over the rainbow at her funeral. My grandpa Harold, Russ Gulata, Prescott McDonald, Benjamin Bo Justice, Danny Solis, today is Danny Solis's birthday. Evan Copacetic so Hillard, Copa to his friends. Norma Vaughn, Bob and Sean Gerbaki, Lisa King, Maggie Estep, Rachel Mighty, known as Adam Tetch, Gabriel Boulian, Zacchaeus Jackson, Chris Crescendo Mercado, Matt Gersting, Palin Perez, Dan DeRosa, Rhiannon Finch, Nicole Ledbetter, Amiri Baraka, Dina Bina, and lastly, Christina Grimmy in the Orlando 49. I'm gonna do exactly one poem, and you're probably never gonna hear it again. Um, we're all adults here. I will never dumb down for an audience. I'm nervous as all hell to do this. But uh, I had a drama teacher who said, if you can't go for good, go for memorable, so. <laughs> it's called By Any Other Name. Trigger warning, this poem contains prevalent use of racist and sexist language. The long-tailed duck is an Arctic species that occasionally winters along the Atlantic and Pacific coast of North America. It used to be called the Old Squaw. At least four species of fish, including the Atlantic Goliath grouper, have been known by the moniker Jewfish. Pike minnows are a freshwater family native to the western U.S., in 1999, the American Fisheries Society adopted this honorific as scientifically sound and proper over the pike minnow's now obsolete handle, squawfish. 
The Sundance or Firewheel is a dazzling red, orange, and yellow relative of the sunflower that happens to be the state flower of Oklahoma, territory famous for its tribal occupancy. I first learned about firewheels from my best friend Shane. They're one of his favorites. Yes, straight men are allowed to like flowers. Let's assume it was frontier settlers who gave the blossom its most persistent and common alias Indian blanket flower. One of the most frequent arguments I come across in the crusade against critical race theory being taught in schools that, is that it threatens to, quote, turn everything into a black versus white thing. This belief is as offensive and reductive as it is reductive. Such, such logic assumes there's only two races that exist throughout the entire world. To dub CRT a black and white issue exclusively amounts to the wholesale erasure of Latinx, Asian Pacific Islanders, indigenous Native Americans, so on and so forth. It implies on the topic of race that only two people get to be ambassadors allowed inside the room. For their jet colored plumage, cormorants were once called nigger geese. And not just as regional colloquialism, we're talking written down in text right there, printed and published guidebooks as recently as the 1950s. Blame Hicks and backwards duck hunters all you want, but it was academic scholars, certified scientists, liberal professors, and explorers with college degrees who told, first told the world this, this is what they're called. This is what we called them now. This is what you're supposed to call them. Semi-aquatic birds such as coots and gallinules have been called moorhens, and this one's tricky. Some say moor refers to an old school word meaning marsh or wetland. Others insist black like Othello. That's the problem with red flag labels. After decades, you forget why and how your subject got that name in the first place. No one can remember why Goliath groupers were first called Jewfish. Some think it's because their scales meant that they were kosher, their massive size making them favorable for Hebrew fishermen to feed their families the same way right whales were the right choice for whalers. If that's true, then motive might not be purely anti-Semitic. Others say it's because their long faces and big lips resemble exaggerated features of cartoon stereotypes or because like an Australian catfish that shares this name, they are originally written off as bottom feature feeders. There is a community called Jewfish in Monroe County, Florida, a Jewfish K in the Bahamas, Jewfish Point in California. We need to talk about profane names of wildlife because the next step is asking why our cities, states, and street names come from tribes that no longer live there. Why there's a stretch of highway in Florida called Colonial and division and the division streets of the world are called division streets. Spoiler alert. It's because they divide the city up by race and income. You don't see racism. Motherfucker, you're standing on it. You don't think you've benefited from racist ideology and white supremacy. You're walking on it. You drive across it every day. It's easier to ignore the veil of whiteness when you don't venture outside enough to ask the plants and animals how they got their name. I initially debated whether to say nigger geese or n-word geese inside this poem. I eventually reasoned that I had to say nigger geese since I had to say old squaw. Cherry picking implies one pejorative is somehow worse than the other. It'd be unfair to speak one obscenity while censoring its siblings or vice versa. Pop quiz, which racial slur is the worst? Answer all of them. To any people of color who may be reading or hearing this, I apologize. I truly don't mean to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm just the messenger. I swear there's a point to all this. To any white people feeling uncomfortable right now, perhaps squirming inside your seat, I'd like to say your ancestors colonized the wilderness. I don't give a fuck about your feelings. <laughs> Every time I tell someone in one of the bird watching groups I'm a member of on Facebook to please, please stop calling them moorhens, I met with blowback every single time they want me to cite my sources as if cell phones they're typing on don't come with Google as if all any of us owes anyone else emotional labor free of course are you sure more doesn't just mean swamp would you mind posting your evidence on the for in the form of a peer-reviewed article what I want to know is why are you asking me these questions and not one of your blackbird watching friends or do you even have any do you even know any black or brown bird watchers? 
Why would you risk calling something by a name that could potentially be hurtful to someone? Why bother juggling a live grenade? That's as bad as calling them coots or gallinules. Only when there's black people around and going back to more hens once they've left behind their backs. Just call them coots or gallinules to begin with. The man in the comment section says, well, that's what my granddaddy called him, so that's what I'll call him. Your granddaddy attended lynchings and drank from whites only water fountains. Maybe pick a better role model and make it snappy downloading the latest upgrade. <laughs> Tradition is peer pressure from dead people. I'm sorry you're such a tool that your granddad's ghost has his hand stuck up your ass inserting dead words into your mouth like a puppeteer. Far be it from me to insult your intelligence, that would imply you have any. Even though you make bad decisions throughout your life, at least no one can accuse you of not thinking for yourself. Everyone wants to fight me over why we don't just why we don't call them more hens. Yet, no one tries convincing me that a cormorant is better off as a nigger goose. It's almost like changing the name of something is really, really easy. There's never been a backlash or flame war because Elton John was born Reginald Dwight. It's almost as if dead names are completely expendable, utterly forgettable. It's almost as if memory only lasts as long as our interest. When someone in a fishing group I'm part of posts a photo of a recent mystery catch, asks for a species ID, someone else says it's a squawfish. I point out, we stopped calling them that 20 plus years ago. Sure enough, he says, I have a fishing buddy who's Choctaw and he's okay with me saying it, oh word. You ever stop to think that maybe your one friend might be a race trader? Their people's idea of a sellout or Uncle Tong, a coward for not calling you out on behalf of their spouse, children, and ancestors. Critical race theory is getting one person's approval equals cosign from an entire ethnicity. Permission to act shitty. But somehow, if I took Hitler or David Duke to be faithful representations of all white people, I'm the one jumping to conclusions. You don't believe you believe in a country founded on democracy. You just don't want to hear any votes expressing a second opinion outside of the one friend who you've clearly tokenized. Okay. Never mind that you honest, honestly believe another man gave you a free pass to use a term specifically designed to disparage women. You're not disrespecting your friend. You're just talking about his daughter, his wife. His mother and grandmother, you think a man gets to be authority on what women of his race prefer to be called. If these people struggle this much with the names of birds and fish, imagine what it'll be like once your kids and grandkids step out of the closet with their new names and gender identities come Thanksgiving. As I was editing, as, as I was editing the first draft of this poem, a new story popped up on my feed. The formal announcement that gypsy moths have been renamed spongy moths. Fingers crossed that gypsy ants are next. Keep in mind, there's a cartoon gypsy moth in A Bug's Life, voiced by Madeline Kahn, who works for a as a magician's assistant for a praying mantis. Scott's Oriole gets its name from Winfield Scott, a military commander who helped kill and displace the thousands of Cherokee along the Trail of Tears. The Piotes were labeled diggers during desert expansion, thus we get the digger pine tree. Bachman Sparrow and the now extinct Bachman's Warbler after John Bachman, a Lutheran minister who defended slavery. John Kirk Townsend lends his name to Townsend's Warbler, the, ta the songbird Townsend's Solitaire, Townsend's Big Eared Bat, Townsend's Chipmunk, Townsend's Ground Squirrel, Townsend's Mole, Vole, and Pocket Gopher. John Kirk Townsend collected skulls of native indigenous people in hopes of proving that whites had the bigger brains. Clark's Nutcracker is a bird related to jays and magpies. It's named after William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. That's not a problem, unless you take issue with the fact that William Clark definitely owned slaves and definitely mistreated natives, including Sacagawea. In 2021, a bronze statue in Charlottesville, Virginia of Clark, Sacagawea, and Mary Weather Lewis was taken down alongside a number of nearby Confederate monuments until 2020. A small, sparrow-like bird known today as the thick-billed longspur was McCown's longspur. General McCown owned slaves and fought for the Confederacy. There's pygmy goats, pygmy rabbits, pygmy marmosets, pygmy owls, pygmy falcons, pygmy nuthatches, pygmy hippos, pygmy sperm whales. The meme says, Gen 2 penguins approach people without fear because they have no natural land predators. The accompanying image depicting a group of penguins harassing human, harassing human bystanders by shouting out their scores on Wordle. It's actually funny stuff, trust me. To the white girl on Facebook, 
who replied when I typed out, I'm just here to point out that Gentoo is an archaic slur for non-Muslims living in India in the comments section with, oh gee, thanks. Because it's archa archaic, none of us know what it, used to know what it means. Now, thanks to you, we all do. I roll emoji. You're welcome, question mark. That was the whole point, question mark. I'm sorry to burden you with free knowledge you didn't have to pay tuition for, question mark. You want me to apologize for being a killjoy? Am I supposed to feel sorry for reading more books than you? Good thing I'm not half Indian. Good thing an entire side of my family tree doesn't all come from Southeast Asia. Otherwise, I might be offended. I thought the whole point of spreading facts and info was so that people could learn more and better themselves and improve the world on behalf of future generations. If you think calling them gentoos doesn't matter because the word's no longer relevant, might I suggest you get more comfortable calling them sad niggers or dot head penguins or anything else brown people have been pelted with before and after 9-11 penguins. You think it's cringe knowing what gentoo means? Those icebound sailors weren't even talking about you. They were talking about me and my family. No one knows how Gentoo's penguins got the name, but I have a theory. Maybe white mariners saw colonies approach them with no natural enemies and were reminded of naivete, of brown people asking for handouts with no reason to assume these giant, pale white walkers who helped themselves into their homes had any intention of genocide, of slaughtering their kind for food. Critical race theory is white guys naming animals in Antarctica what they call brown people back in Asia because they figure brown people in Asia are too poor to travel, can't afford to go places, to buy ships, permitting casual vacations to the South Pole. We're talking locker room chit chat and country club insiderism on a global scale. Shenanigans spanning the length and wish width of oceans and hemispheres as long as the stooge getting picked on isn't there to defend themselves or the groups they represent. Bullies will continue to get away with saying and doing whatever they like question. Is it worse to compare human races to animals, like calling black people apes and monkeys, or French people frogs, or like how mulatto comes from mule because slaves were viewed as livestock, or to behold a brand new species and instinctively be reminded of an entire population of the disenfranchised? Answer, yes. The reason the plural of moose is moose, while the plural of goose is geese, is because goose is in English, while well, moose comes to us from Algonquin. Raccoon also originates from Algonquin, later shortened to coon, for thieving scavengers who eat garbage and roam by night through the dirt and pond scum. Coonhound from the dog strain to hunt them. Coon's tail is a floating plant popular in aquariums, more, subtle, more suitably known as hornwort. In the 1990s, a Holocaust survivor complained to Hasbro about the word Jew appearing in the official Scrabble player's dictionary, lowercase verb, as in to Jew someone out of money. This led to a massive purge of hundreds of potentially hot button words being banned from the pages of all future editions. Know what word is still playable according to the book that accompanies a board game designed for children? Gen 2. Plural gentoos, a grayback penguin, also acceptable for play, moorhen, moorcock, and moorfowl, also acceptable for play, jewfish, plural jewfishes, a large marine fish, also acceptable for play, pygmy, N plural pygmies, a small person, also acceptable for play, old squaw, a sea duck, also acceptable for play, coon, a raccoon. When I was five, my family and I went to SeaWorld to San Diego. I flew back home with a poster from the gift shop adorned with picture profiles of every species of penguin. I hung it on my bedroom wall in Ontario. I memorized all 17 species. Gentoo, Gentoo, Gentoo. Not knowing for over 30 years I've been saying a word old white guys used to describe me. To describe my mom my sister, my grandparents, an entire side of my family. A Gentoo is an Anglo-Indian who doesn't identify as Muslim, unknown origin, possible corruption of Gentile or Hindu. Who the fuck saw a penguin for the first time and thought to themselves, you know what that reminds me of? <laughs> <laughs> you want a point? Fine. Here it is. If we can call the Washington Redskins the Commanders and the Cleveland Indians the Guardians and Reginald Dwight Elton John, we can call Moorhens, Coots, or Gallinules. If we can tear down statues and monuments honoring conquistadors and warmongers who sighed, lost the very cause they were fighting for, 
Updating the names of flora and fauna, fauna seems like a no-brainer. If we can get Hasbro to alter its linguistic policy, if we can enact PC makeovers for Uncle Ben's, Aunt Jemima, the Lando Lakes mascot, and Eskimo Pie, why can't we change the name of a tree or a flower? or an animal to something that doesn't consciously other an entire continent's worth of adults and children. The irony is, guys, I got more invested in bird watching and fishing and hiking as a means to relieve stress. I went back into the woods and the swamp to stave off cabin fever at the height of the pandemic. Instead, by joining community pages on social media so as to indulge my hobbies and better connect with like minds, I end up saddled by unpleasant discoveries. White women who've never considered saying or typing out things like Morhen or Indian Blanket might be squicky or problematic. Retirees who birdwatch on weekdays preaching about how we must all fight to preserve the treasures of our blessed Savior's kingdom and yet somehow don't believe in global warming and choose to vote Republican. Because apparently those <laughs> Those uh, stances can coexist. Ignorance is bliss, and every day I get smarter. You know how hard it is to convince people that critical race theory affects the world of science when they don't believe in critical race theory or science? <laughs> I'll let that simmer. When a long-tailed duck was sighted off Merritt Island, a winter vagrant knocked off course from its usual migration route by coastal storms and Midwest tornadoes born of warmer waters as a result of <clears throat> climate change, I read up on the species in anticipation, responded to online reports, researching in preparation for the upcoming road trip and photo op. My late grandmother's Audubon field guide, published in 1977, still lists the bird as old squaw. Turns out, Americans were the last ones still calling them that, digging stubborn heels into custom. The rest of the world had already moved on, living in the future, calling them LTDs. Turns out they got the name Old Squaw because French settlers in Canada heard their rowdy mating calls and were, remind, were reminded of war cries. Sidebar, yikes. <laughs> Even wilder, only the male ducks even make this sound during courtship, so the name manages to be ageist, old, sexist squaw, a far more egregious misgendering than calling male beetles ladybugs, as if good old run-of-the-mill classic original recipe racism would have been playing the game on easy mode. They were also called old wives, because, you know, balls and chains, am I right? It's believed the term squaw comes from an anglicized version of a Mohawk word for female genitalia. For centuries, this poor duck gets to be a regular bingo card of unacceptable. In November 2021, U.S. Interior Secretary Deb Haaland, Democrat New Mexico of the Laguna Pueblo tribe, publicly denounced squaw as inexcusable. Three months later, in February, she assigned the Derogatory Geographic Names Task Force, its 50-state initiative of gathering better name options for towns and landmarks that broadcast tasteless words or phrases. Colorado. One of the states currently under examinations allows residents chance of both submitting and voting on suggestions for new name candidates via an advisory board website, back to the untamed. The penguin or the LTD aren't at fault for having an unfortunate name. Fire wheels and digger pines aren't responsible for humankind's narrow-mindedness. Critical race theory is learning that nature too is capable of being an unwilling victim. In Florida, the state we all live in, Governor Ron DeSantis successfully passed the Stop Woke Act, which allows parents to sue teachers and members of educational faculty slash staff if they feel their children have been taught CRT without their prior permission or approval behind their backs. For anyone afraid that you or your young ones might have learned something from reading this poem or hearing me recite it out loud at an open mic in public against your will, please take me to court. I would love a bigger platform. It's not like promoters don't already prefer to pay artists exposure to post to cash, not Tim Akua. I would love to bring more attention to issues at hand. I would love to talk about dis te detestable plant names on national television. I would love to be the reason non-white families get inspired to go camping. I would love to contribute to some park ranger's paycheck, especially if they're a woman and or of color. The purpose in all this isn't to scare you away. It's to paint the natural world as more inclusive. 
I believe we need more women, non-male genders, minorities, orientations, and lifestyles working in the sciences. I think it's fucked up what we call the minorities when China and India house two billion people. I believe in rights and equity for underdogs. I believe indigenous locals should get majority profit cut from ecotourism, visits to national parks, and refuges on land that is historically theirs, including the Amazon, African safaris, Caribbean, and Polynesian islands. I will call a Gen 2 penguin a Gen 2 penguin until we've officially come up with a better name. Until then, every conversation comes with an asterisk. By the way, did you know the reason we call them that is because... Once that day finally arrives, I will finally be the first in line to retire its former identity. I don't think the Audubon Society should have to change its name, even though John James Audubon was a half Creole race trader who owned nine slaves. I believe we can accept and admire people's greater contributions to the cultural landscape as painters and naturalists while also acknowledging their sins. John Muir founded the Sierra Club. John Muir made unsavory comments about blacks and Native Americans. How soon we forget Darwin's survival of the fittest was low-key eugenicist propaganda suggesting whites evolved to be the most superior and thereby qualified to lord over savages. Theodore Roosevelt got his face carved in a Mount Rushmore in part for being a conservationist who established 150 national forests, five national parks, and 51 federal bird reserves. He also took lives at San Juan Hill while paradoxically viewing the Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Filipinos, and black buffalo soldiers who had his back on the battlefield during the Spanish-American War to be his genetic and social subordinates. I believe we must continue having difficult discussions about the past and upper class white male privilege and race relations, relations so we don't make the same mistakes in the present and near future. George Santiana said those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. Full disclosure, I'm a member of both the Audubon and National Geographic Societies. I can accept and even live with a history of fuck shit enacted by white and or European adventurers throughout the millennia. What I can't abide by is the thought that we must remain in their world, the boxes they created. Somewhere there is a child in a classroom or an aquarium theme park who loves animals just as much as I did at their age, who is learning for the first time about penguins. They have no idea what Gen 2 means. A child pointing at the glass of a zoo enclosure shouting, look mom. It's a Gen 2. Sounds an awful look like, lot like, look, mom, an Antarctic sand nigger, which doesn't even make sense geographically. There's no desert sand at the bottom of the world. Their habitat is covered in snow. Question, which slur is the worst one? Answer, all of them. For the record, like that kid in our hypothetical scenario, I don't think you're a racist because you said something without knowing what it means. I think you're racist when you argue your right to keep calling it that after the fact, regardless of others' feelings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thinking about someone's feelings and their possible lifetime of multi-generational trauma as premeditated action is this radical concept called empathy. When you call it a squawfish because that's what your granddad called it, that's ignorance. When you call it a squawfish after scientists explicitly tell you it's a pike minnow, that's malice. At that point, you've made a choice. You've chosen to stay an asshole. I'm not saying all this to make any of you feel guilty. I know better than to hold you all accountable for the standards and practices of a bygone era. No matter how I feel about statues or museums full of white man's plunder, I would rather every one of them be toppled and burnt to the ground than to have one more George Floyd or Sandra Bland or insert name of martyr murdered at the hands of prejudice and or live to endure perpetual dehumanization. Y'all, I still enjoy bird watching and fishing. I still love animals. Most importantly, I enjoy learning. I want you all to become bird watchers. I want you to investigate botany and ecology. I want you all to go outside, breathe some fresh air. I want you to enjoy nature and wildlife as a hobby, better yet, a profession. I want you to go to the beach or a national park or to take a walk or bike ride or state skateboard around the corner from your home. Critical race theory means the wilderness belongs to everyone not just colonists who branded everything in their foreign language. CRT is knowing plants and animals had names spoken in ancient dialects by pre-colonial civilizations long, long ago. Every time we say old squaw or Jewfish or moorhen or nigger goose or gentoo or gypsy moth or coon's tail or call Brazil nuts, nigger toes, etc., it's a form of segregation. It's telling black and brown people this isn't yours. 
This doesn't belong to you. You don't belong here. The world you inhabit belongs to us. When you name something, you own it. You claim it, you stick your flag in its spine. If all other branches of science were old boys clubs as much as conventional biology, if we named stars and planets by the same exclusionary white elitist patriarchal hierarchy system that we've used to categorize nature, we'd never get a Mae Jameson or Neil deGrasse Tyson or any astronauts or engineers of color working for NASA. People get discouraged when they feel they don't belong. The great outdoors aren't seen as welcoming when the surprises you find there have names that carry the weight of a whites only sign. Studying the trees in your neighborhood loses its appeal when you start to dream about your relatives who hang from them. Imagine people, you imagine your people picked bright orange bouquets for eons. Then one day, some white dude out of nowhere says, hey guys, we're calling these flowers Indian blankets. See those ducks over there? We think they sound like you. That's critical race theory. Realize names in English mean a white person probably came up with them. Cardinals resemble uniforms worn throughout the Catholic Church. The Vatican is not in North America. The, proton, uh, the prothonotary warbler gets its name from yellow robes of Byzantine clerks, known as proto norderies Byzantine, as in someone arrived from their nesting grounds by boat. I don't know the last time you guys checked the map, but the Byzantine Empire did not extend to North American backyards. It also ended 326 years before the bird was first described by white guy science, which was three years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The natives watched red and yellow birds flit about their whole lives before travelers from across the marine horizon gave them new names after something those who were already here had no access to. A rose by any other name, said Juliet would smell as sweet. A penguin or a duck or a flower or a tree still, by any other name, still teaches us something about our planet. Not just a glimpse into the dark and muddied past, the most heartbreaking side effect of taboo titles is that they distract us from how cool nature really is. How much wonder and excitement we can have familiarizing ourselves with its residents and their accomplishments. LTDs are the only duck species that use their wings to help them dive, setting records for waterfowl, depths as much as 200 to 500 feet straight down. Gentoos move up to 22 miles throughout the water, the fastest swimming bird in the world. It's this fact that inspired Linux operating systems with their Tux the Penguin mascot to give their super speedy Gentoo Linux distribution its name, because apparently someone forgot, more likely an entire boardroom full of white folks didn't know in the first place that their company's product doubled as a shot at brown people. That's what happens when we forget our history. We don't even know who we're offending anymore. Segregation in the wild becomes su subliminal in the workplace. Dr. Emily Zarker says, marginality in often equals monstrosity. And if you think it's all cancel culture rhetoric, just imagine if someone came up with a computer system or a football team and dared to call it, you know what, never mind, forget about it. All this face palming gets exhausting. Critical race theory is everyday technology named after birds whose white crest feathers might resemble a turban if you squint. Every time a non-white person frolics through a meadow, it's a middle finger to white people telling us we don't belong there. Every time a woman or BIPOC go out bird watching, it's activism in the face of the oppressor. Teach your children that environmentalism is a form of activism. Nature is supposed to be a safe space. Welcoming your loved ones and colleagues into green sanctuary, the vast jungle playground while defending its overall health makes you a freedom fighter. You want to stick it to the man. Memorize your warblers, your sparrows, your ducks, your penguins, your fish, your trees, your flowers. Nothing drives white nerds crazier than being the most well-versed on their topic of expertise. Nothing pisses off gatekeeper professors and scholars like a woman or minority who's more knowledgeable than they are. Last page, guys. My ancestors died so I could be the smartest person in the room. Your ancestors died so you could be the smartest person in the room. I'm not afraid of traversing ecosystems on a planet that we all inherited. The planet will one day pass on to our grandchildren. I'm not afraid of animals or poisonous plants or mushrooms or the wrath of the elephants, uh, elements. I respect them. I respect these forces enough to understand them. When you understand your environment or the weather, it becomes predictable. Where I'm from, Florida represent, they say everything either wants to kill you or suck your blood. It's not sharks that I'm afraid of. 
Not gators, not scorpions, snakes, or spiders, not possums, armadillos, or raccoons, not even mosquitoes, not lions, tigers, bears, or wolves. I'd like to think I know a thing or two as a competent tree hugger, a citizen scientist. I'm not afraid of thorns or cactus spines, beaks, claws, antlers, or fanged teeth. I've hooked stingrays and scorpion fish on my line. I always carry pliers with me whenever I go fishing, so as to avoid getting bit or stung. I've seen black bears, coyotes, gators, three crocs in the Everglades, a full-size moose roadside in Algonquin Provincial Park, two black widows, a coral snake on my front porch, an eastern diamondback rattler in the wild. I know how to stand in awe and reverence, how to take a step back, snapping photos from safe distance beyond striking range to paraphrase Muhammad Ali, formerly known by the dead name Cassius Clay. None of those creatures ever called me a gentoo. Neither bird nor beast ever locked horns with me in the comments section. No visitors to my bird feeder ever insulted my intelligence. Not a squirrel nor daisy in the, gar nor daisy in the garden ever threatened harm on my life. You want to know what the most dangerous animal in the world is? I'll let you all in on a little secret. It's people. It's humans. Every time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. You always manage to have excellent social commentary talking about birds and flowers and grandma's tin cans and uh, cookie cans so i just love that thank you so much for that all right we're here every third friday every third sunday of the month and we really hope that you enjoyed it come back safe space for you to try first time come back and do it again bye everybody actually just one thing very important uh july there is no there is no there's no event in july also, just a second, if you perform tonight, make sure Nadia has your full name and spell correctly because my son has to make the video and I need it for the credits. Yeah. Uh,